Sit. Welcome everyone to the virtual monthly meetup. I'm Sarah Bolton. I'm your host. And um, if this is your first time joining us, we meet the first Monday of every month from 6.30 to 7.30 Central Standard Time. If you're new to the Myasthenia Gravis Association, uh, we provide support and services to those impacted by Myasthenia Gravis in their communities. Feel free to check out our website at www.mgakc.org for more information, or you can email us info at mgakc.org. Um, we also have, is McKenna Fulton here today? It is, McKenna is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, McKenna is here. Um, she's our MGA Community Program Coordinator, and Allison, I think you already introduced Hi, yourself. <laughs> Good to see you all. Uh, let's see. Did you already do some announcements? So we've talked about the May virtual monthly meetups. So if you want to go ahead and talk about the flow for this evening uh, and then introduce Angela. And then um, I let them know Andrew will be coming on um, at the end from KU Medical Center. Okay, great. So should be good to go. Yeah, and then um, following today's session, you should get a survey and we, we super appreciate your feedback. And this evening, we are excited to have Angela Pontius. Did I say your name correctly, Angela? Angela Pontius, yep. <laughs> okay, Pontius. Um, with RA Ventures joining us, Angela is a familiar face to the MGA as she was a keynote to our annual meeting in 2019 and has done other trainings and sessions with patients since that time. Angela is Vice President of Clinical Operations at RA Ventures. Angela's primary responsibility is to lead the development of cutting edge best practices in clinical strategy and execution and oversee their implementation at RA portfolio companies. Angela has over 16 years in clinical operations and having experience worked at, um, sorry, having experience working at clinical sites within a CRO and at both small biotech and large pharma companies. Angela holds a BA in pre-medicine and French studies from the University of Minnesota. Thank you so much and welcome, Angela. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. And um, thanks everyone for taking some time out of your evening to learn more about clinical trials. So I am going to share my screen. And all right. Is everyone able to see my screen? All right. Um, so today's going to be pretty. I, um, what I want to cover is um, clinical trials basics, and then hopefully what you'll do is walk away and feel more confident as you potentially look into clinical trials, um, as well as uh, talk to your doctors about potential clinical trials that might be right for you. And uh, before I start, I just need to uh, provide my disclosures. And uh, yes, as um, Sarah mentioned, I am an employee of RA Ventures, but tonight I'm here as just myself as an individual presenting my own thoughts and uh, only on my behalf. And tonight I am not providing any uh, medical advice, but if you have any questions about your specific uh, condition and uh, any clinical trials that are specific for you, a great resource will be the MGA. They can connect you with uh, some specialists as well as your doctor. And uh, we can talk about clinical trials now. Oh, sorry about that. Just, there we go. So what are we going to cover? Uh, the basics for tonight is I want you to walk away knowing what are clinical trials in general and then how you can find a clinical trial that might be right for you. And then once you decide that you want to participate in clinical trials, what you might expect as a participant. So before we start, I want us to kind of talk 
the same language. And so basically, uh, I just want to be able to define a few different terms for you and get on the same page. So what is a clinical trial? A clinical trial is a research study that collects information and data about an experimental or investigational drug. And when we say investigational, we mean a drug that's not been approved by the regulatory agency. So in the US, it's the FDA. And clinical trials are really important because they're basically collecting data and information to confirm if a investigational drug or a new drug, potential new drug, is safe and effective to uh, for the patients and can be marketed and sold in the uh, in the states. And there are two different types of clinical trials. There's observational as well as interventional. So that means uh, if it's an observational study, we're just looking at the way that the disease occurs in its normal settings. So that might be a natural history study, potentially a registry study. And then there's interventional uh, trials, which basically are looking at these experimental or investigational drugs and finding out if it's safe and effective. So some common terms that I want to just get through uh, so that we're, again, talking the same language is, uh, include uh, a few terms here and on the next slide. So when we are talking about a study, there is always a protocol that is carefully designed. It includes all the information about what is actually being studied, what kinds of tests will be collected during the trial, and um, what the processes are for the trial. This is basically the rule book for the study, and this is submitted to the FDA and as well as groups called the Institutional Review Boards, and I'll explain a little bit more about those in a little bit, but basically telling them exactly what's going to be, do, uh, what exactly is going to happen in the study, and um, they end up approving it or asking for changes to make sure that it's um, safe for patients and has um, the right questions are being asked, and then the study it follows this protocol throughout the entire time. Then there's the study drug. So we already kind of talked about that. That is the investigational or not approved drug yet uh, that's being studied. There might be something called a placebo. So a placebo is uh, basically a, a form, it looks like the drug basically, but it doesn't have any of the active treatment. And so uh, oftentimes there is um, a comparison between how the study drug worked and how the placebo worked. And that kind of goes into the next term. So the control group is um, when there is a comparator. So we need to compare how the study drug acts in comparison to uh, a control group. So the control group might be a group of patients who are receiving placebo or uh, potentially standard of care. And uh, randomization is when um, basically like a flip of a coin, um, patients are assigned to either receiving study drug or the control group. Then a few other terms that you might come across when you're looking at clinical trials include blinding. So blinding is basically when somebody doesn't know what the research participant has been assigned to. So usually in that, um, a study where there's a control and the study drug, there um, is an assignment. So you randomly, the patient gets assigned to either um, placebo or control group uh, or study drug. And then um, usually the participant is blinded. Uh, sometimes the study doctors are blinded as well, just so that there's no bias um, in the data that's being reported. Other terms that you might see, especially if you're looking for trials on clinicaltrials.gov, are endpoints. So really what an endpoint is, is the um, what's being measured to see if the drug is working or not. 
Uh, one term I just mentioned is standard of care. So that's basically a treatment that's already widely accepted by um, the medical experts as treatment for a disease. So an MG, an example of standard of care might be IVIG, plasma exchange. I think someone mentioned that they're on that. Uh, Mestinon, uh, prednisone, things like that are standard of care. Then uh, the study sponsor is basically the group that is funding the research and they're ultimately responsible for the research. So some examples of a study sponsor might be the NIH or a private uh, pharmaceutical company. So I'm sure um, you've seen many names out there in the MG space. Um, those are private study sponsors. So now that we have the terminology put aside, um, I think the next thing I wanted to cover is uh, just the general phases of clinical trials. And really what I wanted to cover here is, um, the reason why I want to tell you more about that is um, kind of pointing out the amounts of data there are after each phase, because that's probably really important for you to know. So when um, the general, uh, journey of a, an investigational drug is that it's first going through a discovery phase. Um, basically, somebody identifies that there might be a potential drug, and they do a lot of different tests on it on animals and on cells, and they collect all this preclinical or basically before it's in human studies. They collect all this data and then what they do, and I'm going to stay specific to the U.S. because that's where we are, um, they're going to submit that information to the FDA to say, we have this drug, this experimental drug, we're interested, we believe it might do X, Y, and Z in a disease, and this is our protocol, this is how we want to study it, and um, we're submitting a request for an, um, uh, an investigational new drug application. Um, and what the FDA does then is review that protocol and um, kind of gives the green light at the may proceed letter that um, the study can be done. And the first phase of that study research or of the research on the drug is a phase one study. This is usually done in healthy volunteers, really small amounts of drug. And really what we're trying to learn is, is the drug safe? How is the body processing the drug? And what are the side effects that we're seeing in these healthy volunteers? Once we learn that information, then um, the drug is able to go into phase two. That's where we're learning more about um, safety as, and side effects, and really kind of digging into the details of what dose should we be using for this drug and how well might it be working. And this is um, tested then in patients, in a little bit bigger uh, group of people. And then once you have that data and you uh, confirm that it is safe, that we have an idea of what dose we should use and it looks like it's working in this disease, then the drug gets tested in phase three trials. That's the confirmatory trials. That's basically confirming what we found in phase two is true. And uh, that's done in a larger population, um, basically more patients, and uh, really learning if the drug is working well, that it's basically doing what we said it would do, that it's safe, and that all the benefits are outweighing all the risks of uh, the drug. Taking all that information from phase one, uh, from preclinical phase one, phase two, phase three, the company will or the sponsor will submit the data um, to the F, if it's positive, we'll submit that data to the FDA for a new drug application. And the FDA will determine whether or not the um, data provides, the data submitted provides enough um, information that the drug can get approved and sold to patients um, and of it made available outside of clinical trials. But What's important for you to know is that even after that, there's additional studies that are, uh, that are still done to learn more about long-term side effects. And basically, even in the long-term, is the drug still working well? And what I wanted to point out here is that when you look for clinical trials or when you learn about the different clinical trials that are, are available, you might see that there's a phase two trial open or a phase three trial open. Now you know that 
if you're being approached to potentially participate in a phase three trial, this is how much data is available and that you can ask about. Um, that you know the drug has already been studied in phase one and two. It's now moving into this confirmatory phase, and um, this is the big trial that is being submitted for new drug application. If you're being approached or looking at a phase two study, it's a little bit earlier in the drug development process, so there might not be as much information available, but still sufficient information available where the FDA has approved kind of the, the move, uh, the green light for it to move forward into this phase of study. So I just kind of wanted to share that with you because I'm sure as a patient, when you look uh, in the on the long in the long list of clinical trials, you're probably wondering, well, what does this really mean? So hopefully that helps you kind of think more about, um, as you're thinking about studies, know a little bit more about what data might already be available about that uh, investigational drug. So who has oversight of clinical trials? So it's not just the study sponsor. So the person who, the company that is developing the protocol, the company that's responsible for the drug trials, uh, there are other groups that are um, involved in terms of oversight. So again, the person, the company responsible or the individuals responsible for the study is the study sponsor. They are basically providing the data, they're running the trials, they're developing the protocols, but they have to submit all of that to the FDA for oversight and approval to move forward in the research. And they, the FDA provides guidelines, rules and regulations about how to do the research, and they uh, ultimately oversee the entire process of the drug development as the study sponsor submits information to them. So without the FDA letting you know that you can move forward, drug companies cannot move forward with their research. So they do have to get FDA approval to continue to do their research. Then even at a, another level of oversight, at every single study center, uh, so for example, KUMC or University of Missouri, there is an institutional review board. This group also reviews the protocol and all the study materials to make sure that the study can proceed at the study site. They basically provide oversight on behalf of the patient to make sure that the study is being done according to the protocol and uh, is um, be uh, that the safety is being reviewed and just offers another level of, of oversight. Then some studies may have a data safety monitoring board. That's basically an independent group of experts that the study sponsor has identified as an independent committee to overview safety. So there's an additional level of oversight. And then finally, at every single study site, there is a study doctor and their team who oversees your, your participation or the patient's participation in the study and their safety throughout the study. So now that we've kind of gone over the basics of um, the terms and kind of the definitions and all of that, let's talk about the journey on um, as a patient. So before you start a clinical trial, you have to find one. So basically what you would do is either, um, I'm gonna go to the next slide, you're gonna find a clinical trial either through your patient advocacy group like the MGA, uh, another great resource is clinicaltrials.gov. Your study doctor or your actual just doctor, your regular doctor might have an idea of um, clinical trials and they may also be a study doctor. Or you might see different types of adver advertisements uh, through social media, through maybe your radio, TV, things like that. What I would say is um, some really good sources and kind of telling you about the different types of sources here. So your doctor will potentially know about different trials, especially if they're already participating in trials, um, or they may be connected to specialists who are running trials. So they're a really great resource for you. A group like MGA is great because they're going to know about the clinical trials in your area. It might not be one that your doctor is aware of. So that's also a really great resource for you. And then another one, although I find it 
uh, a little bit, probably there's a lot of terminology in there that might be confusing to you, but clinicaltrials.gov is a really good resource because every trial that is run in the United States has to be listed on clinicaltrials.gov. So it's very comprehensive. Unfortunately, sometimes the terms and the language in each posting can be a little bit confusing, but that's where you can really rely on groups like MGA or also your doctor to help you better understand what's exactly being included in that trial. So maybe sometime um, if we have a follow-up uh, meeting like this, I'm happy to run through a clinicaltrials.gov search for you live. Uh, we can poll you and see if that's something that would be useful to you. So you're going to find a trial, and I've been mentioning the term study sites. So basically, trials are conducted at study sites. They might be universities, private clinics, or hospitals. And the study sponsor, are they're selecting sites based on the doctor because they're an expert in the disease, they have experience in research, they have a study team in place, and they're in a location where there are actually patients around them that might be uh, interested in clinical trials or eligible for clinical trials. And then with uh, everything going kind of remote, um, there's been a lot more focus on offering remote assessments and visits that might be you might be able to do in the comfort of your own home. So even though there is a study site involved, um, some of the visits might also be done at in um, at your home. So that's something also to kind of ask about once you're looking at clinical trials and you find a doctor that's running a trial that you're interested in, uh, that's definitely a question that you should consider asking. So when you're thinking about whether or not to participate in a trial, so you've found a trial, you've done your search, you found a doctor that is running the trial, you've been talking to them and they present the trial to you. Uh, what are some of the things that you should think about before you decide to participate or not? So there's definitely some burden and risks. Um, you know, I think every sponsor does tries to do a good job about reducing that. But ultimately, we are collecting additional information and data. And so there might be just some additional burden to you. Um, so there's some, potentially some additional time, some additional travel that you have to do to go in for your study visits and the assessments. You might be asked to do some additional visits that you wouldn't necessarily do uh, just for standard of care. Uh, you know, some of the clinical tests that are done in trials are very specifically done so that they collect standardized data and make sure that we can compare to basically we can understand whether or not the drug is working in comparison to the control. And so, you know, these additional tests might take a, more time or just might be burdensome for you. Um, there is the potential that, you know, this is an experimental treatment. So there might be side effects or uh, it may end up not working. Or as we talked about, uh, if there is a placebo or control arm, you might receive placebo or standard of care. So those are things to consider um, as potential burden or risks. And then there are benefits. Uh, you might get additional care from the different doctors that are working on the trial. You might have access to newer, potentially more beneficial treatment. You might help just altruistically helping understand better understand the disease, uh, helping with future treatment options for future patients, and uh, just really helping research progress in the future. And you know, without clinical trials, we're not going to be able to get drugs approved or learn more about drugs. So it is a very important process, but I understand that it's not for everybody. And then the other thing to just note if you end up deciding, okay, I'm okay with the burden and risks. I, I think that the benefits outweigh that. Uh, even if you decide that a clinical trial is something you might wanna do, um, you might not be eligible. So you might go through the screening process and unfortunately might not uh, be the right candidate for the trial. So that is just something to keep in mind uh, just so that you don't get your hopes up. So, I just talked about, you know, potentially not being the exact right type of participant that they're looking for. And so every trial has a specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. 
they want to make sure that the population of patients are the right types of patients that they are uh, looking to study. And this is because maybe the drug is targeted for, like for, for example, an MG. Maybe it's targeted for patients who have ACHR positive MG or, you know, so they don't necessarily want to enroll patients who have musk MG or who are zero negative. So, uh, you know, this is because their dark drug is targeted for a specific population. So that's really the reason why it's not to just exclude you for the sake of excluding you. There is a scientific rationale behind that. And uh, some examples, again, I mentioned a specific one for MG, but other things might be your age, your overall health, uh, the type of treatments that you've had in the past. So, you know, those are things that may, uh, you know, be required or uh, for you to meet, um, to participate in a trial. And then just to kind of highlight that in general, uh, participating in a trial is always on a volunteer basis. You do not have to participate in order to get treatment for your disease. Um, so, you know, just want to make sure we highlight that. And I've provided a list here of things that you should ask if you're considering participating in a trial. And um, I just due to time, what I'll do is provide this uh, as a PDF maybe uh, to Allison, Sarah, and McKenna, and they can share that with you after the meeting. But, um, you know, there's a lot of great questions to ask. And the thing I want to highlight here is this is these are not just questions you should ask at the beginning of the study. Of course, you should ask them at the beginning. But also know that throughout the entire study, if you have any questions, please ask them to your study doctor. They are responsible, you know, for you to make sure that you understand what you're part how you're participating and what your participation means. So don't be shy. Ask as many questions as you want. That's what they're there for. Okay, so we found a clinical trial. You've decided. You've met the study doctor. You found a study site that's right for you. Uh, you've asked questions, you've decided you want to move forward with screening, what's next? So uh, before anything starts for the study, you have to sign a informed consent form. Um, basically, at the beginning of the study, before anything starts, the doctor will explain to you what the purpose of the study is, what you should expect during the study, basically how long is the study, how many visits do you have, when do you have to come in, what are, what's the information that's available on the uh, experimental drug to date? What are the risks and benefits for you? If you decide that you don't want to participate, what are the other types of treatments that are available to you? What might happen to your data, to your confidentiality, and how is your uh, privacy protected? If there is reimbursement or compensation for participating, and um, who you should contact if you have any questions. So they'll go through all of these things with you. And again, this is the time for you to ask as many questions as you want. This is when you need, to, um, you should get all the information um, so that you can determine that this is the right next move for you. So again, don't hesitate and never feel pressured. This is a completely voluntary thing to do. So um, uh, you should know that. And then what happens at the end of this conversation is that they present a form for you to sign. It's the inform informed consent form. And you'll always receive a copy of that with you to re um, refer to throughout the study and um, to utilize that if you have any questions and uh, need to contact someone if you have any questions. And then I did want to mention that there is another form called an assent form. Uh, now with so many potential pediatric trials out there, I just wanted to mention that is a document that would be signed by um, someone who's under 18. And it's basically information presented to them um, in an understandable manner. All right, so once you get consented, you um, are confirmed to be eligible, then you study start the study. And um, maybe just to step back a bit. So basically when it comes to the study, uh, there's something called a baseline visit. So what they'll do, what the doctor will do is collect your 
baseline information. Um, basically taking that information and then one day when you're done with the study, they'll be able to compare how you, what happened um, from the beginning to the end. And um, what you'll do is come back to the study site or maybe do some of the assessments at home and participate throughout the, the trial. And as a study participant, you do have some responsibilities. So basically, all the data that you're providing is very important to the integrity of the data. So it's very important that you follow the instructions from your study doctor. Uh, again, all of this information will have been presented to you when you consent to participate in the trial. So please come in for your study visits as they've been scheduled. Uh, if you're taking any study drug at home, uh, please make sure you do that based on the instructions. And if you miss a dose or you forget to take a dose or if you take too much, you know, please contact your study doctor. Um, if you have any side effects and they happen between the study visits, between the times that you see the study doctor, make sure that you note them and you report all of those to them. If anything is kind of urgent or severe, make sure you contact them right away. Um, if you're taking any other medications and it's allowed on the study, Make sure that um, you know you continue to stay on those drugs as your study doctor lets you know if you can take continue to take them or um, if you should stay on stable doses. Uh, and then also just just basically tell them as much information as possible. Too much information is not there's it's not possible to have too much information. So. You know, just basically be as transparent and honest with your study doctor as possible. Um, and then just a couple things to note that you shouldn't do. Um, you should just be mindful um, of sharing information on social media or with your support groups. Um, if this is a blinded trial, you want to just make sure that um, you're not potentially sharing too much that it could unblind somebody or um, if you are sharing side effects or information, that should have at least gone to your study doctor. So, um, you know, they need to know that information to report that and, um, you know, help understand what's going on during this trial. So it's just important that your main line of communication in terms of side effects or things like that um, is with the study doctor. And it's likely that you cannot participate in multiple different clinical trials, especially if they're drug trials. Uh, you want to make sure that we want to make sure that the data we're getting is on one type of drug. And uh, of course, you wouldn't be able to kind of take two different type of investigational drugs at the same time. Sometimes you might be able to participate in like registries or something where you're not receiving drug. But if you have any questions about that, definitely contact your study doctor and ask before you participate. All right, so you've gone through the entire study, you've followed all the um, study, uh, the rules and all the study assessments, and you've, you've gone through the entire process and you're at the end of the study. Um, basically, what happens at the end? Because I'm sure you're curious if a study is you know, a few months long, a year long, what happens after that for you? So in your specific case, your study team or your study doctor will let you know exactly kind of what the next steps are for you. You might be able to continue to receive the study drug um, in a different study. Maybe it's an open label extension or some sort of access program that they have. Uh, no matter what, your care, your health care will be taken um, care of by your study, your doctor potentially who might be your study doctor. Um, if you have any side effects even after taking the drug, make sure to report those. And uh, you can even ask about, you know, if you're curious to know if you're on study drug or placebo, the study doctor might be able to tell you, uh, depending on where the study is, if they're still enrolling in that trial, they might not be able to tell you right away but eventually they may be able to let you know. Um, and then they can also let you know at the end of the study, once there are results available and data available, you can ask how the study went and they should be able to share that information with you. Uh, and if you, for some reason, lose contact with them, you can even refer to clinicaltrials.gov. Every study is actually required to report the results uh, 
on that registry. So you can follow that for more information. And then depending on what phase of the research, so phase two or phase three, um, if it's a phase three trial, then at the end of the study, maybe even after a year or so, the um, drug might be approved depending on how the study went. So those are just things to, to know um, what might happen at the end. Okay, so I do see some questions. Um, that's all I have in terms of clinical trials. I, um, and I'm just gonna answer some of these questions. So the first question is regarding um, plasma exchange, basically be, um, having the, being consistently on plasma exchange and whether or not you can participate in clinical trials. That's gonna be really specific to every study. So what I would do is if there is, if you're interested in general about clinical trials, I would definitely contact uh, your doctor or if your doctor isn't participating in research, I know MGA can connect you to some great doctors who are. So maybe a good question for them about your specific case. And then another question that came through is, are the clinical trials just for drug treatment research or for other treatments such as nutrition. Um, today I was sp talking specifically about drug trials. Um, there might be research or studies going on about how nutrition or exercise might affect your disease. Um, and the best way to find those would again be, I think a great one would be going to clinicaltrials.gov. And maybe if we even have some time tonight, I could run through, we'll see. Um, and we can do a quick search for you, but um, really just clinical trials can be for any type of potential treatment um, if, if they need to do the research before getting approval. And if there's any other questions, please feel free to ask. Oh, Allison, I think you're still on mute. Oops. Well, we wait to see if there's other questions that come in. We could pull Andrew from um, the University of Kansas Medical Center over to share about the clinical trials that they have going on there, um, if that's okay. I think he's raising his hand. Can I bring him over? Um, can you see Andrew? There he is. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Allison. You guys see and hear me? Yes, we can, can see. All right, you. awesome. Great, so uh, thanks everyone for joining this evening. My name is Andrew Heim. I'm a research manager at the University of Kansas Medical Center. I've been working there for almost seven years in neuromuscular research and in MGE research. So um, we're very involved in myasthenia gravis research. We only have uh, six or seven ongoing trials in MGE that I'll briefly go over each one with you this evening. So, um, and if you guys have any questions, of, for, of course, feel free to put those in the chat. So uh, the first study I'll go over, we're doing with a pharmaceutical company uh, that goes by the name of Momenta. This is a phase three trial. It's a randomized double-blind placebo controlled. So the drug that they are studying in this study is called Nipocalumab. And it is an IV infusion that's done once every two weeks. Like I mentioned, it's double-blind placebo controlled. So there is a placebo arm, but there is an open label extension to that study as well. The next study I'll go over is with a company called Viela Bio. This is also a phase three trial with an open label period at the end. Uh, the drug that's being studied there is enebolizumab. This one, oh, and I should have mentioned, sorry, in the uh, first study, it's only enrolling ACHR positive patients. Um, but going back to the Viela Bio study, this one is enrolling ACHR and Musk patients. So both can, can join that one. This is another uh, drug that is administered via IV. Um, and it's done essentially three times throughout the study, days one, 15, and 183. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is an open label period as well. 
Next study we're doing with a company called Janssen. You've probably heard of them. This is also um, looking at nipocalumab, um, but this is actually a pediatric study. So enrolling patients from age from two to essentially just below 18, if they're you know, 17, 11 months, they could still enroll. So this is a pretty small study. Um, the, the patients in that one will be receiving nipocalumab once every two weeks as well. And they are, if they complete the study, they are eligible to enroll into a long-term as well. The next study is with a company called Immunovant. This one is also a phase three. It's randomized, uh, double-blind, placebo-controlled. The drug in this one is called batoclimab. There are two different period arms. So essentially in this study, they are looking at, it's, it's a subcutaneous um, injection in this one, it's done weekly. And in this one, they're looking at different dosages for this medication. And then in the second arm, they're looking at administering it weekly and then biweekly. So in this phase three study, they're really kind of trying to figure out which, uh, what is exactly the right dose to give to MG patients. The next one uh, that I'll go over is with a company called Alexion. Their drug is just called ALXN1720. This is again a phase three study. It's double blind placebo controlled. On um, this one, patients will get the medication once every week um, for 26 weeks. And then there is an open label extension for this one as well. And then the next two studies that I'm going to go over are quite a bit different than any uh, other MG studies that we've gone over. So uh, these next two are using what's called a and you have maybe heard that from cancer research because that is where it originated. It is a pretty common therapy used for cancer research. And these two studies are two of the first ones to explore this type of treatment outside of cancer. So it's very exciting. We're partnering with the Cancer Center at KUMC to be able to do these trials. And we're partnering with oncologists to help us run these trials. So, and luckily there is one for ACHR patients and then the other one is for musk patients. So the first one is with a company called Cartesian. This is the ACHR study. This is a phase two trial, or it's, it's sort of like a phase one B two A trial wrapped into one. Um, but this is looking at CAR T therapy. This one does have, this one is a randomized control trial. So it does have a placebo arm, but there's also an extension as well where you will receive the drug. So if you participate in the study, no matter what, you will receive the drug. Essentially, patients that are randomized to a placebo at a certain time point, I think it's about 80 days after being in the study, uh, they'll be unblinded and then they'll roll over and receive the actual uh, treatment. And then the next one is with a company called Caballetta Bio. This is the one with um, for Musk MG patients. This one is phase one. It's open label. There is no placebo uh, part to it at all. And like I said, it's using the CAR T therapy. So uh, patients do go through leukophoresis treatment. Essentially, uh, we kind of harvest your cells. They kind of get repurposed and then infused back into you. And like I mentioned, it's a very effective treatment uh, for cancer. And this is one of the, or some of the first studies that are looking at this outside of cancer. And the, the goal of both of these studies is, is essentially, you know, remission. Um, obviously it's still very early. These are, you know, both essentially phase one trials, but we're very optimistic and excited about these trials. And for both of them, we're really the only site that's kind of local to the Midwest. Um, in the Cartesian study, most of the sites are either on the West Coast or in the Northeast. And in the Caballetta Bio study, the only other sites are all on the West Coast. So we're the first one away from the West Coast that are gonna be enrolling in these trials. So if you guys, th those are all the studies. If anybody does have any questions, feel free to you know send those over um, and we'd be happy to answer them and speak to you guys more, so. Andrew, I do have a question, and it kind of piggybacks on Vern's question earlier. For the last two clinical trials that you talked about, can you be on plasmapheresis and be in the trial? No, no, unfortunately, you cannot. Um, so plasma exchange or plasmapheresis is usually exclusionary in most of the interventional MG studies uh, that I've seen and, you know, been a part of uh, in my seven years here. 
um, and the washout period is is usually right around six months. So I know that's you know a therapy that doesn't occur very often. And so if if that's something that people may be interested but are afraid of coming off, it would you know come at a time right around when you're supposed to be getting that next plasma exchange. So um, just something to keep in mind. And of course, our study doctors are happy to discuss you know the, the positives or the negatives and all that sorts of stuff when it comes to that. Thank you. Absolutely. Are there other questions for Andrew? I have a question. Maybe um, there's a lot of studies, Andrew, that you mentioned. Will the is there like a list that will be available? Yes, so if you guys um, ever read or indulge in the MGA newsletter, we always put our active clinical trials there as well. Um, and as you mentioned, clinicaltrials.gov is really a great resource. So um, you can go on there. You can just search myasthenia gravis. There's a filter for, you know, actively enrolling studies, and you can search them by, you know, the area too. So if you're local to Kansas City or, you know, maybe if you're in Arkansas or whatever, you can, you know, narrow it down by city or state or you know, however you like to, that way you can find one that's semi-local to you as well. I'm gonna drop the most recent newsletter in the chat. It went out last week. Perfect. So Sarah, I don't know if you want to take it back over with Angela and Andrew, but it looks like we have about 10 minutes left. I don't know, Angela, if you wanted to drive anything from the clinical trials website if we had time. Oh, we have a question. Can you see the question, Andrew? I can, yes. So the question uh, is, if, is that if you are in a phase two trial, can you be included in the following phases, like phase three or phase four? And uh, to answer that, it is study dependent. So it will depend on the type of treatment that you receive. In most cases, um, especially for MG patients, you are typically allowed to participate in various research trials. The thing to consider is uh, kind of like how I mentioned with plasma exchange, there's usually a washout period or a certain amount of time that you need to be off of a certain medication, especially if it's experimental, before you enroll into the, into the next study. So it kind of depends on, you know, um, the life or the half-life of each drug that you may have taken. Um, so usually that washout period is about three months, sometimes it's six months, sometimes it can be up to a year years as long as I've ever seen it. But um, yeah, typically enrolling in more than one is, is okay, just depending on that washout period. Any other questions? So we Turn it back over to Angela. Any, I guess if there are, are any other questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Just general questions. Hopefully everyone feels like they know a little bit more about clinical trials, but um, you know, again, if you have any questions, uh, my contact information will be provided to Allison and the team, and uh, Andrew's a great contact, of course, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Awesome. Anything else, Allison? Um, I can't think of anything. Angela, this is great. Thank you so much. 
for your um, really educational um, session about clinical trials. And Andrew, thank you so much for um, letting us know what's happening at KU Medical Center. I think sometimes it's better to hear it verbally than to read it. So um, appreciated that update for sure. It's an exciting time. Absolutely. All right, guys. Well, hopefully we'll see you in May for our patient panel. All right. Thank else? you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Have Bye. a nice evening. Thank you, everybody.